you very much, everybody, for coming. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to present uh, about this climate change and the land report by IPCC, to which I was co contributing. I was a coordinating lead author of chapter on desertification. And I'm also very happy that today we have some contributing authors also with us, Eike Ludeling, who contributed also to this chapter. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, first of all, let me start by giving you the full title of the uh, report. It is on uh, climate change, on desertification, on land degradation, on food security. So the title testifies to the complexity of issues that this report handles, but also at the importance of looking at these issues together, not separately, but in an integrated manner. The report was uh, prepared over the two years uh, by 100, more than 100 authors, uh, more than 200 and other contributing authors, there are several firsts in this report for the IPCC's work. First of all, uh, uh, in this report, social sciences played a, an important role in a, along with natural sciences. Uh, secondly, this, was the, this report, report set records in terms of the role of women scientists in leading positions. More than 40% of CLA, so coordinating lead authors, were women. This was also the first ever IPCC report where the number of authors from developing countries was more than the authors from developed countries. If you look at the structure of the report, it has these seven chapters. Uh, it starts this with uh, framing and context, talks about the natural science of climate change and land interactions, and then goes to the topics of desertification, land degradation, food security. These are the key three pillar chapters, and then we have uh, chapter six and seven looking at the cross-sections, synergies, interlinkages, trade-offs, uh, and associated risks and opportunities. So what is new in this report? First of all, as I said, it's integrated nature, so it uh, looks at how we use natural resources, resources uh, uh, in a way that relates to food, water, and energy securities. It looks at land degradation from human food security perspective and how land degradation uh, is related to poverty. It also looks at incentives related to markets and institutions, how to facilitate sustainable land management so that it can contribute to climate change adaptation and mitigation, but also to sustainable development goals such as food security, poverty reduction, uh, achieving equality between men and women and others. So if I briefly summarize what are the key messages coming out of this report, these are these three in this uh, shown here. Land is under growing human pressure. Land is part of the solution, but land cannot do it all. So let us go now a little bit beyond these headlines to the specifics of the report. Uh, the report shows that currently we use about 75% of global land area uh, so uh, these are, of course, we can see croplands, pasture lands, plant forests, and only 20, remaining about 25%, one fourth, is not under active human use, of which half are basically uh, barren areas, rocks, uh, other land, uh, deserts, uh, and then uh, there are some other areas like remaining uh, forests or grasslands. One of the uh, key reasons why uh, uh, there is such an expansion of human land use over, this land, uh, over the planet is because of uh, food demand for food and agricultural production. This figure show here the uh, sometimes very strong and rapid growth in uh, food demand, population, which are, which are of course related to population, uh, total calories consumed, but also we, have, we, we see that together with increasing prevalence of overweight and obesity, we have also growing number of people uh, who, who are underweight currently, compared to 1980, for example. If you look at the agricultural production side, uh, since 1960s, we have seen eight times increase in use of inorganic nitrogen fertilizers. Of course, irrigation water use also increased uh, rapidly. This is a, a seri cereal yields were also increasing as a result of these two factors. And also livestock production. In some areas of the world, 
these trends have resulted in land degradation and desertification. Now, if you look at, the, at this figure, it shows the number of people who are uh, living in areas which experience desertification. So increasingly, more and more number of people are relying on the soils in those areas uh, where the, the, the fertility of soils is declining. So more reliance on dwindling resource base. And also over the years, since 1960s, the area of drylands affected by droughts increased every year by 1%. So uh, the, the report clearly shows that the climate change and land degradation have a st very strong interlinkages, interactions. Climate change exacerbates land degradation. Land degradation is also a driver of climate change. Uh, currently, uh, uh, gross emissions from agriculture, forestry, and other land uses make up one third of total global greenhouse gas emissions. Land accounts, for some, in, for some types of greenhouse gas, gases, land accounts for a lion's share. So for example, for methane, land accounts for 61% of emissions. About half of the nitrogen fertilizers, which are applied in our fields, are not taken up by crops. So they are released to the atmosphere as nitrous oxide emissions. This figure shows the outcomes of uh, the continuing impact of climate change on different aspects of uh, uh, our lives. So uh, this is so-called uh, reasons for concern and figure, or also known as burning embers figure. So what you can see here is that different levels of temperature grows, and then how these gr temperature warmings would translate in terms of risks to different dimensions. So we have if it's uh, uh, white, it's undetected, so if it's yellow, it's moderate risk. If it's red, it's high risk. If it's purple, very high risk. So what is the uh, uh, moderate when it's yellow? It means that we can already see impacts of climate change and we can attribute it to, uh, uh, so we can see impact, we can attribute those things into climate change, anthropogenic climate change. When it is red, it means those impacts, those risks are widespread, have higher costs. When it becomes purple, uh, there is another additional element bringing, uh, kicking in. Uh, it's not only w more widespread, more frequent, more costly, but it's, there is also this irreversible element. So uh, whatever we do in terms of adaptation, there may be, we, we may not be able to avoid some damage coming from climate change when it's purple. So uh, if you look at these different dimensions, so we can see that already drylands are experiencing now, currently, currently we are here, uh, moderate levels of risk coming from water uh, scarcity, but with increasing temperatures, uh, the risk will be growing. In terms of food supply instability, we already somewhere, uh, in, with, already we are in the moderate risk category, so 1.5 degree will push us to the red, higher risk area. So now let me talk a little bit more on land degradation and desertification, desertification topics in more detail because this is the area where I was myself contributing in the report more closely. So uh, the best estimates we have now show that currently from 1.5 to 3.2 billion people live in areas affected by land degradation globally. The 3.2 billion figure have become uh, an iconic global figure showing uh, the number of people affected by land degradation. It was cited already before in the IPBES report, but I think many, not many people know that this figure comes actually from this institute, ZEF, uh, uh, under, where uh, under the uh, initiative on economics of land degradation, uh, Baole and his co-authors mapped global areas of land degradation and identified these number of people living now in those areas. So uh, about 500 million of these people live in drylands which experience desertification. So if you look from these numbers, what is clear in terms of quantities is that land degradation is happening both in drylands and outside drylands. And from what it appears number of, in terms of number of people affected, in terms of the area affected, land degradation seems to have a wider reach and impact outside drylands. 
Since 1961, the annual area of drylands which experienced drought each, every year increased by 1%. So of course there is this variability from year to year, but what we can see clearly that the area of drylands experiencing a drought is increasing by 1% relative to the base in 1961. But drought does not mean desertification. Droughts occur everywhere. It can, they can occur in drylands, they can occur outside drylands. They are a normal feature of any climate. Uh, and what the re, uh, report shows, there is no evidence for a projected global trend in aridity. Climate change will increase aridity and drought in some regions, and it may decrease aridity in some other regions. So uh, uh, there is this uh, kind of a uh, picture sometimes you have when you uh, read about this topic that uh, there is constant increasing area of drylands, increasing aridification of the global area. Uh, this discussion is based on something called aridity index. So aridity index precipitation divided by potential evapotranspiration. So once the temperatures are growing, uh, there is mathematically increase in aridity. But aridity index uh, has been, although it has been serving as the kind of a framing element of dryland research for the last 30 years, it has never been a perfect indicator for identifying drylands. It has been a proxy. But under changing climate with increasing level of carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, the relevance of aridity index will be even less than currently. Because uh, if we look at the precipitation, if we look at the vegetation, there is no indication of expanding aridification as a global trend. Some areas will experience more aridity, some areas will experience less aridity. Uh, so soil erosion with conventional tillage uh, is estimated to be more than 100 times higher than rate at which soil is formed. So we are at, that means that in many areas where we are applying these high levels of soil tillage, we are just mining. Uh, the, our soil basis. Now, let me talk about some of the things which we got a lot of comments in the, during the uh, preparation of the report, and probably these are the areas where there is a lot of, perhaps, uh, misunderstandings or different uh, perceptions. What is the difference between desertification and land degradation? Desertifi uh, the difference is not process-based. It's geographic. Uh, land degradation is a global phenomenon, Desertification, it's subset happening in drylands. And drylands here are shown in this, these drylands uh, are shown in these colored areas. So desertification is land degradation when it happens in dry, subhumid, semi-arid, arid areas. So uh, in the report, we defined land degradation as a negative trend in land condition caused by direct or indirect human-induced processes, including climate change, anthropogenic climate change, expressed as a long-term reduction or loss of at least one of the following, either biological productivity, ecological integrity, or value to humans, including economic value to humans. And desertification is land degradation in drylands. So the same definition applies, but it is when it happens in drylands, we call it desertification. So land degradation, as I said, is a driver of climate change through emissions of greenhouse gases and reduced rates of carbon uptake. But at the same time, human-induced global warming has already caused observed changes in two drivers of land degradation. It's increased frequency, intensity, or amount of heavy precipitation, so more heavy precipitation more soil erosion, for example, or increased heat stress. And global warming beyond that, what we experienced till now, will accelerate these processes of desertification and land degradation through various extreme weather events like floods, drought, frequency and severity, cyclones, sea level rise, and others. But of course, we need to understand that outcomes will be always affected by our land management. Currently, drylands cover about 46% of global land area, so almost half of the global land area, and are home to 3 billion people. So when we talk about drylands, we are talking about basically half of the world, worse in terms of area and in terms of population. So these are very uh, significant areas. Although drylands are greening on average. So if you look from the satellite, we can see that there is, on average, drylands are greening. 
uh, the range and intensity of desertification have increased in some dryland areas over the past decades. But what is important, greening also sometimes masks the underlying land degradation. For example, when greening is because of bush encroachment. Or you may have read uh, some uh, reports and even papers showing that there has a lot of greening in some over some countries in Asia. A lot of that greening, especially over croplands, is, is explained by intensive fertilizer use. So uh, there may be greening when you observe from the satellite, but if uh, fertilizer is compensating for underlying degradation of soil, that may not perhaps be a sign of land improvement. So to be able to come to a clear picture about desertification or land degradation, you need to remove these uh, masking effects of these factors. The major human drivers of desertification, uh, as we have seen, are croplands expansion, unsustainable land management, and increased pressure on land from population income growth. Climate change will make these um, several desertification processes wor worse and increase associated risks. And desertification and climate change uh, will reduce the provision of dryland ecosystem services, ecosystem health, including biodiversity. So we did, we did a qualitative assessment of how the interaction of climate change and desertification will affect the attainment of sustainable development goals. So what you see here, the length of these bars shows the magnitude of impacts. To what extent these two interactions will, will affect the attainment of certain objective. And then we have here different shades of brown is the uh, confidence level that we attach to these uh, impacts from low to high. So what is coming out from this assessment is that poverty reduction, zero hunger will, uh, of, and of course, uh, land degradation neutrality, climate action will be strongly to a very large extent affected by these interactions between desertification and climate change. But we also see some other uh, effects, such as on gender equality, uh, on uh, sustainable access to water and sanitation, on renewable energy. So what we can see from here, the interaction between climate change and land will affect many, many, many SDGs to a very strong degree. Achieving, SDG, achieving climate goals without addressing land degradation is challenging. Without achieving land degradation neutrality, without taking into account the climate dimension, is also uh, not very easy. So uh, there are a lot of solutions that we already know, technological solutions uh, to reduce, uh, to avoid, reduce, reverse desertification, which can also contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, some examples are like water harvesting, micro-irrigation, agroforestry, or other agroecologically focused farming methods. Or another option would be promoting cleaner, renewable uh, energy sources, for example, in dryland areas to reduce dependence on traditional uses of biomass for energy. Uh, so what the report also underlines strongly is that investment in SLM, so sustainable land management, have positive economic returns. Over drylands, every dollar invested uh, can bring back three, from three to six dollars in return. So this makes economic sense. Indigenous and local knowledge oft, often contribute to enhancing resilience against climate change and addressing land degradation and certification. But at the same time, we need to understand that in many areas of the world, indigenous and local knowledge is uh, getting lost. And uh, uh, in many areas, the precious demand pressures are so high that indigenous and local knowledge alone may no longer be able to cope. So it's important to combine this indigenous and local knowledge with modern scientific innovations and research. Preventing desertification is preferable to restoration of degraded lands, and response options can mitigate climate change and also advance sustainable development goals including, for example, through land degradation neutrality objective, LDN. Uh, what we found that 
for pursuing those LDN objectives, land degradation neutrality measures, can contribute to climate change adaptation and mitigation, and also to other sustainable development dimensions. So that refers back to also to our assessment of the relationship between SDGs on land and climate that we did earlier, that I showed earlier. So the report assesses the following 28 uh, response options. It looks at the interactions between them. What are the synergies? What are the trade-offs? So broadly, they can be divided into land-based, response options based on land management, on agriculture, on forests, on soils, on other ecosystems, and then response options based on value chain management, like reduced post-harvest losses, dietary change, or response options, options based on risk management, livelihood diversification, risk-sharing instruments like insurance. So, of course, uh, these response options has the capacity to contribute to all these goals, climate change, adaptation, mitigation, enhanced food security, but there are limits of some of them. For example, if you look at the uh, bioenergy crops, if they are deployed at very large scale, that may have trade-off with food security. So what the report does, it goes through these options and then tries to find what are the trade-offs and synergies between adaptation, mitigation, land degradation, electrification, food security. So uh, before going there, let me just explain a little bit on the legend that we will need to know uh, for uh, seeing those, uh, when we see those uh, figures. So when we have this blue line, it means positive impact. So positive, these are synergies. Uh, and then if it's brown, it's negative, so trade-offs. And then associated levels of uh, mitigation adaptation. Mitigation in terms of gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent, adaptation in terms of number of people affected, desertification in terms of the area, similarly for land degradation, and then food security also in terms of the number of people affected. So uh, the larger the effect, so, so the more darker blue means more people affected. And then we have letters like HML, which stand for high confidence, medium confidence, low confidence. High confidence means that there's a lot of literature on that, and the literature agrees on, on certain point. If it's low confidence, either there is not enough literature or available literature does not agree. And then we have different cost ranges. So in terms of some of the land management options with large mitigation potential, so here we can see agri increased food productivity, agroforestry. Here we can see blues all across the figure. So there are synergies, positive synergies. So when they're applied, like agroforestry or increasing food productivity, they may have positive effects across mitigation, adaptation, and other dimensions. Sometimes we have low confidence, sometimes we have mediums, and sometimes we have high confidence on these findings. Similarly, for fire management, restoration and reduced conversion of coastal wetlands, So now if we go one by one in some of these aspects, so if you look at the reforestation and forest restoration, so we can see that large-scale adoption of these practices by large-scale, uh, uh, we mean about 10 gigatons equivalent of carbon dioxide removal per year. So it's basically 25% of global, current global emissions. If there is large-scale adoption of this, we can have positive impacts in terms of mitigation, that's, and in terms of adaptation, perhaps also in terms of desertification, land degradation. But there will be negative and strong negative impacts in terms of food security, because this reforestation, forest restoration will take away land from food production. But when applied at small scale, using best practices, then effects could be synergistic, positive. It doesn't have to have negative impact on food security if applied, is if these practices are done at small scale using best practices available currently. Similar effect with afforestation. So we can see here strong effects on this dimension and then food security, maybe trade-off if it's large scale. So, but we don't know, here gray means we, there is not enough evidence to know about food security impact when it, even when it's done at lower, small scale. So there's a lack of gap, of in, gap in knowledge currently that we have. 
So one of the uh, controversial topics is bioenergy and bioenergy capture and storage, carbon capture and storage. So here, we, what we can see here, the effects are very diverse depending on which dimension you are looking at. Here we can see it's, it has positive impacts in terms of sequestering carbon, but then in terms of adaptation, it may actually have some negative impacts, of course, with some low confidence, but this is what we detected. This hatched lines means that there is some negative pressure, but it's not fully known yet. And then definitely a strong potential negative impacts on food security if it's done at scale. So uh, uh, we are talking about 11 gigatons of carbon equivalent removed using bioenergy and BECS. But when done at small scales, using best, practice, best practices, it doesn't have to have negative impacts on these dimensions, and we need more research to say more about food security impacts. The same thing uh, for biochar. So biochar is an uh, uh, organic uh, uh, amendment to soil. So uh, when you use organic material and burn it in, uh, area, uh, in an environment with little oxygen, you can uh, have biochar. So when it's applied it can, it can have, to soils, it can serve as a soil amendment. It can have positive impacts on mitigation and on land degradation. So those areas, especially outside drylands in more humid areas, but then we can have trade-off with food security because of the uh, material, uh, the biomass that is needed for preparing this biochar could be also used for, for livestock as a feed. Uh, so, but when done at small scale, it can have positive, small positive synergies all across these areas. Of course, these are the technologies, but technologies are not alone, uh, cannot alone bring us to what we need. We need also enabling policies, policy uh, environment, and the uh, uh, report emphasized a lot on such measures like land use zoning, integrated landscape planning, adoption of payments for ecosystem services, which will incentivize land users to adopt these sustainable land management measures, providing access to markets and agricultural advisor services, securing land tenure, empowering women, and many others. And this could also come through already existing frameworks such as land degradation neutrality framework, Important conclusion was that reflecting the environmental cost of land degrading agricultural practices, so uh, internalizing externalities, if we speak in term, uh, using economic terms, can incentivize more sustainable land management. So, but there are limits to adaptation and land-based carbon sinks. So uh, when desertification results in complete loss of land productivity, so when it's irreversible, then there, is, there may be, it may pose limits to what we can do in terms of ad adapting to climate change using land management options. And so there are also some types of land degradation which are very difficult to adapt to, like thawing permafrost or coastal erosion because of the sea level rise or extreme forms of erosion. On the sequestration part, there are also potential limits to uh, carbon sequestration by trees when they reach their saturation points. And then once uh, uh, the carbon stro stored in these high, uh, in, in these uh, uh, biomes with high level of carbon sequestration could be when it's when it, when damaged, when perturbed, it can release a lot of carbon dioxide, so it may pose uh, uh, important risks. So, the, uh, so the, currently there is enough knowledge to take action now. Many sustainable land management actions make strong economic sense. And then we already can do a lot of things right now, like, such as capacity building, technology transfer and deployment, enabling financial mechanisms like carbon trading, imp improving uh, the monitoring and measuring of land degradation, and others. So, Overall, the message from this report is that better land management can play its part in tackling climate change, but as we have seen, all these limits and trade-offs, it cannot do it alone. And I would like to finish with the big picture message from the report as a whole, that potential for climate 
mitigation can only be realized if agricultural emissions are part of the mainstream climate policy. Acting early will avert and minimize risks. It's important to measure progress, so to have this measuring uh, and monitoring. And flexible, adaptive, iterative approaches are needed for this complexity of land and climate interactions. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be happy to respond to your questions and comments. Thank you very much, Alicia. Um, great points. As you know, the um, German government has uh, released a climate policy package uh, uh, last weekend. The first point is not much adhered to. Um, it's mentioned that agriculture should be included, but uh, only to a minimal extent. Um, so more is needed. Your questions to Alicia, please. Go ahead. Um, yeah, my name is Oli Kinnaman. Before Paris, I used to work as an integrated expert in the climate change office of the Ministry of Environment in Georgia. So I was involved uh, in the preparation of the nationally determined contributions. And my impression was that, that while everyone agreed that agriculture and forestry uh, is, is important, it was hard to put a number on it. So because of that, for example, there was a focus on sustainable forest management, and it was a higher profile, but they couldn't say like how much, yet how much, uh, how much carbon it was restored. So what you, Back then, what you saw, and I had a discussion with, with forestry colleagues uh, from PIZ, uh, that you saw a lot of afforestation measures in the NDC because that was something you could put a number on it. And they didn't commit to something else because they couldn't put a number on it yet. And that was my view. W would you agree with that? And, and I think now is the process that every five years, this nationally determined contribution should be updated. So is there any plan to write something like a guidance for or analyze which country, or like best practice analysis, which countries uh, are already do it, including this in their nationally determined contribution, and how others might improve their, their, their land, uh, land use uh, and forestry component in the NDC. Yes. So uh, uh, a lot of the things that uh, uh, would result out of this afforestation, forestation project are very context specific. It depends a lot on the local context, what kind of measures are taken. Uh, currently, I think uh, under the next uh, IPCC report, so sixth assessment cycle of the IPCC, uh, uh, there is uh, a discussion about uh, uh, the uh, different uh, regional assessment of how these mitigation options are playing out in different regions, which will contribute to the global stock take, stock take in 2023. Uh, in terms of the uh, issuing guidelines, IPCC uh, uh, does not issue guidelines uh, uh, which are policy, I mean, on uh, how to do things. Yeah, but yeah. someone else, I mean, are you aware of someone else doing uh, uh, I'm not aware, but uh, probably if this kind of guide guidelines would come from the convention, U UN, uh, FCCC. Uh, but currently what, what this report shows is that uh, first station and first station measures can have on average globally can have significant mitigation potential, uh, but uh, uh, we need to uh, understand that they may have trade-offs with food security. Uh, if, apply, if done in dryland areas, we need to be very careful because sometimes afforestation measures can actually increase water scarcity, uh, yeah? so especially if it's done by uh, imported tree type species and others. So uh, we have seen in some areas of the world where they planted uh, uh, forested dryland areas, very arid areas, tree survival rates were very low and it, it resulted in rather negative outcomes. And at the same time what the report emphasizes is that uh, many uh, afforestation measures which are done now, of course they are very useful and helpful, but uh, the trees will reach their prime sequestration rates in several decades from now when, when we plant them now maybe 50, 60, 100 years, depending on. So uh, what is important is to avoid deforestation, cutting down of the already uh, existing trees. Mm -hmm. OK, next one. Go ahead. Jamal Matuchewa, UNCCD Secretary. 
This may be just a commenting again from the previous speaker and then a question. Actually, I had many questions left on this case, but then just one. Um, yes, we really have a, a lot of hopes for this report to provide a very strong message for the climate change colleagues also to start uh, also considering and taking account of the land as a mitigation source, not only as an adaptation, which requires the case. Uh, but again, we come to the uncertainties in terms of the methodology. So as all the countries, and especially where the AFOLA sector is so important, they recognize it and they include it in the, uh, the national determined contribution, still they cannot come with the concrete figures. But those figures also needed for the finance, so access to the markets, which are being prepared right now, and I think they're all waiting for the Paris Agreement to be to, to come to the full force in next year. Uh, because only having those exact numbers can really allow the countries to start marketing. Um, but this is still a problem. So therefore, I, was, my, I have exactly the same question, whether the report has some kind of, a, um, I don't know, kind of a spin-off of giving a bit more precise on the methodology, how to calculate, uh, you know, the mitigation potential, potential of different ecosystems, but maybe that will be coming. And also, we're just coming from UNCCD, COP14 in India, and uh, uh, also the countries had a very, um, I mean, they all agree that we need more synergies for the climate change, and um, so we're also asking for the synergies in the programming level of the countries and providing the common guideline how to uh, we're not talking about the merging or uh, we're talking about coherence between the national commitments under the climate change and uh, under the UNCCD with the land degradation neutrality. So at least it is there uh, the request for the common guidelines, so for the governments, how they can you know, apply a different, uh, in, let's say, uh, instructions from two conventions and they can, can come up with a you know, more comprehensive planning in the country. That was the first, um, it was just a comment, and the question is, it was very interesting to see uh, the large scale uh, versus small scale uh, restoration, because you know that from 2021 there will be UN decade on the ecosystem restoration and we we'll all talk about the large scale transformative. And this is again, would be very much linked to the uh, large scale investment which would be needed. But now the report shows that in fact the smaller scale restoration could be much more effective. So how does that, you know, uh, is, this, is, this, is this is how I understand it, that it's not that we really have to do a large scale like a blanket restoration, mm -hmm. it's rather the mosaic restoration uh, on, in the different part of the landscape. So, because this is an important message, because so far we're talking, you know, we want to see a greening spot from the satellite, mm -hmm. you know, like a great green wall in, in Africa. We want to see this green strip, but uh, is, this is what we really need. Yeah, uh, no, what this uh, uh, report assessment shows that, of course, it depends which objective you are taking. If you are applying large-scale land re restoration activities, afforestation, then of course it will have a large-scale mitigation uh, outcome. So it will sequester, help sequester more carbon. But then, but then it will start having trade-offs on other areas that we also don't want to lose on, like food security. Uh, or adaptation in some cases. Yeah? So uh, it is important to have this trade-off part in, in mind when selecting the scale. Uh, so if we, uh, some estimates show that one-fourth, 25% of all the mitigation promises under Paris Agreement would need to come from land. So, uh, but land, uh, the more we ask from land, land cannot do it all. So it cannot provide both mitigation and food security. So uh, we may need to sacrifice something at some point. Yes, there, there is a trade-off. That's why, but when you do it at smaller scale, it can still contribute to mitigation, but at the same time without sacrificing on food security, food stability dimensions. So that's why uh, this smaller scale was emphasized that uh, to have 
to, be, to remain at the synergy level, small scale would help. If you want to really emphasize on mitigation part, uh, perhaps at the extent of other dimensions as well, then perhaps large scale would also serve that purpose. Um, I may ask a question. Um, during the Paris uh, Climate Summit, the four per million uh, debate was uh, uh, very vibrant. Um, I didn't see this uh, now in the report. Um, the more I listen to soil scientists, the less optimistic they have become. Is that, uh, can, you, can you update <coughs> us uh, what happened with science on uh, a lot of uh, mitigation potentials of soil management for, for yeah. carbon sequestration? I mean, uh, for, for, uh, uh, this objective uh, is uh, a very uh, excellent aspirational goal in terms of uh, achieving carbon sequestration. But when it, when it comes, uh, uh, what we find when it comes to the specific how to achieve that, uh, it, uh, there, uh, there were a lot of questions and uh, contradictions in the literature as well. Uh, our group, which prepared this report, also had authors who were behind those initiatives uh, uh, for, per, uh, for, uh, for per mille. And uh, uh, the, uh, what the report shows that uh, uh, trying, uh, Taking measures that contribute to that objective is something very positive, but we may not be able to achieve this objective everywhere. It, it may simply not be possible. Yeah. Um, I may say the, uh, the winner of the uh, German Environment Award, which will be released in a few weeks by the German president, is a soil scientist, Professor Kugel Knafner from Bavaria. And uh, uh, I asked her. Uh, informally, uh, could you achieve four per million in Bavaria, which is, has the best soil mapping anywhere in Germany, and only the Netherlands has as good soil maps. And she says exactly what you said. Uh, at some locations, maybe, but at other locations, it's very difficult. So I think it's uh, we have to, to take a hard look at what soils can really do, so that we are not misleading, um, um, misleading climate policy makers. Um, Carlos. I was really also struck the, the emphasis put on the trade-offs is great, really. But the contrast between the large and the small scale obviously is, is, is very marked in the way you have pitched the analysis. What does sort of large scale mean? Did you have some standard criterion? Is this that every pocket of the world which could be afforested will be afforested? Or what is the large scale for this report? Could you take notes? Uh, there were two other hands and then we make another round. Go ahead, please. Yeah. My name is Paolo. Uh, I'm just thinking about like Last row, there were other hands. Okay, so go ahead. Yeah, it's a guy from ESG. Yeah. And former Seth. Former Seth. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here actually. Yeah, Alicia, it's a very interesting discussion that we have. We just came from the co conference of parties in India. And one of the strongest mitigation options when it comes to land climate change and the applications also water. I mean, I have seen all this list of response options, but I was expecting also water to play a role. We have seen something like agricultural water management somewhere under. But I would expect maybe the role of water as a big factor one. The other thing is, uh, you're talking about small scale. How, sm how small is this small scale? Okay. Yeah. 
So uh, in terms of the uh, large scale or small scale, so uh, uh, it, it depends on the technology. So it based on the assessment that was done uh, uh, on the literature. So, uh, for example, afforestation, I, what I uh, uh, know, they used like the size of area of India would be planted uh, uh, with, in the model, which come to that with, with, will be afforested. And uh, in terms of, uh, also a lot of this thing is coming from the outcomes like afforestation, about 10 gigatons of equivalent will be removed from the atmosphere as a result of that. So that's a, a, a kind of indication of a large, uh, of the scale of how it's large. In terms of small scale, uh, many of them are, I think, uh, 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 based, were based on the literature coming from the plot level, from the perhaps uh, some local level. Uh, so uh, uh, whenever done uh, at uh, farm level, uh, whenever done at perhaps at smaller watershed level using some integrated landscape approaches so that it works well. Uh, at small, that would be more on the local level, that would be small scale. We discuss a lot on the water, on the role of water. Uh, if, we look, if we look at the chap into the chapter on desertification, uh, on dry, water management in drylands, uh, uh, we list a lot of the technologies uh, uh, related to water and how it will help uh, with uh, mitigation and adaptation. We also talk about expanding irrigation in certain contexts. Uh, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, where uh, currently there is still some unutilized potential with that, but with one caveat is that a lot of that irrigation may come from groundwater use. There is some reusable, renewable groundwater part which could be used, but then uh, experiences from around the world show that it very quickly led groundwater overuse, over extraction and it may lead, actually exacerbate many of the land degradation processes. So it can be done to some, if it's used renewably, irrigation could be still expanded, but if it's overextracted, then it can be, it can create problems. In terms of the forest and afforestation, uh, trade-offs between food security and other aspects, of course, that's, that was, that's actually at the heart of the report. Uh, uh, and uh, many of the options that we discussed, both technological and also, but also policy options, uh, could help to some extent to alleviate that trade-off. For example, payments for ecosystem services when communities derive their livelihoods from taking care of forests. Uh, uh, that could perhaps to some extent alleviate the pressure on using that, cutting down that forest and using it for agricultural production. If we improve agricultural productivity, so are having higher yields, of course there's a lot of debate about land sparing or land, but uh, that could uh, also be uh, uh, an element of, of the response. So uh, uh, I invite you to read, into, uh, there's, um, there's a lot of discussion about Malawi as well in the report, so you could have a look so, into the report, but uh, what the report emphasizes is that there are solutions which can help us to achieve synergies. It doesn't have to be always a trade-off, but just we need uh, some sort of uh, environment, policy environment to make that happen. Um, Lisa, let me ask you an economics question if there's no hand up. Um, uh, what's the shadow price of CO2 behind your cost dots there? Um, what do you mean by high cost, low costs? Um, was there any modeling behind it? What was the methodology to come to costing? Yeah. No, costing is uh, the cost of implementation of these measures. Uh, the actual cost of planting okay, that Okay, but the uh, cost of implementation then has a shadow price, uh, a hidden price. What's, uh, what's a ton CO2 implicitly assumed in that cost? $20, $100? No, I think there was... What's a dot worth? Yeah. Uh, one of the, uh, so, uh, one of the uh, gaps in this report is that uh, we are talking about the cost of implementation, but uh, we are not talking about the returns uh, from that implementation. And uh, that carbon price element would so feature... only half of economics was done. Because of the existing... You're talking cost without benefits. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was, that was the thing that we, uh, it was possible to do uh -huh. at this current level. There was a lot of discussion and debates how we can go to the other half, but it was not possible at this stage. Let me continue to give the report uh, critical reading. Food security. Um, how was that figured out? 
I mean, uh, the world consumes uh, only 15% plant-based calories. The rest is feed. So uh, the report holds um, the demand side of food consumption constant uh, with the current uh, wasteful feed meat complex. Uh, no, I, I think that... Um, Was there modeling behind food security effects? Uh, the, uh, of course, the report uh, took into account the growing population size and growing demand size. At constant consumption patterns? Uh, that one, I, I think I would need to <laughs> refer okay. to some other colleagues, but right. uh, 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 what I, uh, a lot of this work, I think, was done using uh, available literature uh -huh. uh, on assessments, and uh, there were more than 100 people working on that, and uh, yeah. I was mostly contributing more closely on the desertification and land degradation part of this report. Which is an excellent area. There's on Thursday evening a debate on global biomass bioeconomy um, and uh, in the uh, university main building in the Senatsaal. Um, so if you're interested like I am in these topics, uh, then come there. You have the last question. Oh, okay. So I'm Nils Bloom from the DAD. Um, I have a question. You started the presentation with a, a little introduction on who was involved in this uh, report. So um, I would be very interested what your experience is because everything from my point of view is worth only if uh, there is some policy uptake as you already mentioned in the beginning. So um, if there are much more people involved now from developing countries, what, what is that what you get from your colleagues if they go back uh, or if they, they stay in their, in their cities, wherever they are? Uh, and there's some um, interlinkages also with the policy level, and that there's the now a higher worth also if they contribute now to these reports, that there's also um, higher policy uptake potential, or what is, what is mm -hmm. your experience with that? Yeah, there, there are two, two ways you could approach that. First of all, when you have that more diverse group, the uh, report itself becomes Ha, will have more diverse ideas, it will cover more angles, it will give more perspectives. So uh, the important part of involving uh, a diverse group of actors, uh, authors, is to have a better report. Uh, secondly, of course, that had, uh, there were about 8,000 news articles on the support after it was published. And many of them were in many developing countries. And all these, uh, uh, my colleagues who uh, worked uh, with us, gave interviews, uh, did public outreach of the findings of the report. There was a lot of, for example, uh, 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 our UNCCD colleagues will attest that in India, uh, during the COP, Indian government uh, had a, a very clear understanding and idea about this report, and it was one of the reasons they have upgraded their pledges to uh, land restoration activities. So it had already uh, tangible impacts. It, uh, it in general, uh, this report was important by putting land and food systems firmly on the climate, uh, the importance of these two on climate action, for climate action. That it's important to take into account agriculture, food system, if you want to have an uh, action uh, on climate change mitigation mm -hmm. and adaptation. Yeah. Thank you that you asked this last question. Um, those of us who have followed um, the conferences of the parties and climate change and the IPC processes um, probably quickly agree that this report is a breakthrough. Um, agriculture and land use has been excluded from COP negotiations. The forestry community and the agriculture community did not move together forward. That's why they came into each other's ways. So in Copenhagen, I. Uh, remember, it was uh, um, a, a disastrous outcome. So that the IPCC step by step has stepped on the soils and included agriculture is the breakthrough. And the next COP, I believe, in Chile will also pick up agriculture in a lot more formal ways. Currently, we can speak of influence, impact 
we want to see uh, in terms of policy change. Thank you. A round of applause, please, for our listeners.